want to hear a little bit about, I want to introduce myself and why I'm here, and then I want to hear about you, what prompted you to come to this presentation, so that I'm sure to include some information in the talk that's pertinent to you. I'm going to go over some, over some information about uh, shoulder issues uh, to help understand um, what can go wrong and the typical type of uh, issues that tend to come to these presentations for individuals. And then what we do is get a chance to see how we assess someone for their shoulder problem and do this thing we call a five minute miracle, which is a chance just to see how some treatment intervention might affect uh, movement performance and pain in someone's problem shoulder. And then we can let you know what next steps are after that. So a couple things before we begin, there's restroom straight through that door, uh, the second right then also straight across the hall, the first right. Uh, so if anybody gets, needs to uh, do that, go ahead and do so. If you need to stand up and stretch during the presentation, by all means, do so. And if you like ask, asking questions, go ahead and do so as well during the presentation. I've got content, but I'm happy to field questions as we go along. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is uh, relieving rotator cuff and shoulder pain naturally without medication, drugs, or surgery. Um, and uh, we help people achieve greater strength and mobility for their active life without medications, injections, or surgery, <clears throat> even when nothing else has worked. A um, little bit about myself, I've got over 30 years of clinical experience, um, nearly all of that in Oshkosh. I've had the privilege of being trained as a fellow in the American Academy of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy which doesn't mean a whole lot to most folks, other than it's a chance, it was a chance for me to learn about the best practical applications and what the research supports for pain relief from head to toe and helped a few folks along the way. We've got other providers here as well. Dr. Rebecca has uh, got over 10 years of experience. She's a, a specialist in what's called Applied Gary Gray Science Movement, which is a way to assess how movement influences one part over the next and she's helped a number of people she's terrific she was voted the wisconsin physical therapist of the year in 2019 and we know why patients who see her uh, really appreciate her dr jessica is a graduate of marquette university she's been with us um nine months now she's certified in vestibular and balance and also certified in dry needling and she uh, does a phenomenal job. We've got two physical therapist assistants that worked on our team. Unfortunately, I don't think we've got the slide ready yet for our newest one, but this is Gina. Um, Gina's specially trained in massage and pain relief, uh, sports recovery massage, certified spine specialist, certified upper extremity specialist. And then uh, Courtney is another physical therapist assistant. We'll have to add her to the slide. She's been with us for a few weeks uh, as well. Uh, Lori Shates is an occupational therapist. She was the first person I contacted when I was thinking that I was going to open up a clinic. I've known her for a good number of years, darn near 20 now, and she's certified in lymphatic and swelling, fierce patient advocate, and uh, she does a lot of education nationwide for edema, lymphedema. So it's a little bit about us in the building. Uh, helps to get an understanding of our perspective. So. Why was physical therapy or physical achievement center uh, started? I'll uh, tell you the real short version here is that I got out of fellowship training and I looked around and I basically said, what is going on? There's a wide gap between what is uh, possible, what we see in the clinic and what research supports and what's being advised or not even discussed with patients in the community. So I had worked uh, for over 20 years at Winnebago Mental Health Institute, state of Wisconsin, as the physical therapist there and worked in a number of different capacities outside of there. And I realized that people weren't being offered all the best options or even all their options when it came to pain conditions, whether it's neck pain, shoulder pain, um, low back pain, knee pain, and so on and so forth. So I felt compelled to start a practice five years ago. The same things that we did five years ago, we're doing now. We do public education workshops to help improve pe people's understanding of their options. Um, and even now, even though the research is continuing to develop, even though clinical results are there, 
people are not oftentimes advised of non-surgical, non-drug approaches to their muscle, bone, joint pain from head to toe. Bottom line, that's why we start. We want to make people make great healthcare decisions. Um, anybody here heard of the concept of evidence-based practice? If there's any clinicians in here, um, uh, like RNs, basically what it means is that um, it's a way of looking at how to make really good healthcare decisions. At the center of it is the patient, the patient preference and <clears> understanding. <throat> then, um, if you think of those Venn diagrams, those circle diagrams, then if you combine that and you have some agreement with what the practitioner is skill and expertise is, and then if you have another circle that has, hey, what does research support? When those three circles uh, combine, when the patient uh, knows their options and can choose them, when the practitioner can support that choice with their expertise and when research supports it, your chance, when all three things meet, check. Your chance of a really good outcome is very high. Um, the problem is you can't make good healthcare decisions if you don't know of all your options. <clears throat> and I can assure you from the, from the conversations that I have with patients when they go to their providers for shoulder conditions that they're not providing all their options. Um, so. That's uh, why we started this. Um, we obviously want to uh, be biased treatment towards conservative, non-drug, um, non-medication uh, or injection procedures. And we're at, we feel we're a great source for those that are confused, stuck, or just want other options that they're presented. And we're certainly not gonna respect folks by saying things like, what do you expect at your age? Or you're just gonna have to live with it? that sort of thing, that is not acceptable. Um, so, it's a mouthful. <laughs> um, I enjoy public speaking when it comes to topics I'm passionate about. I don't really like talking about myself that much, to be honest, I'm more interested in finding out um, what brings you here. So if, so if you would, this is an opportunity for us to share a couple things. Um, if you could give us your first name and what brought you to the workshop today um, what is your greatest concern? What issues are you having, right? So, um, all right, uh, thanks for sharing. I, I'm, uh, we'll cover, I think, all those topics, and by all means. Um, I've got a presentation here, I'm happy to use this, but we can also ask, uh, answer quite, oops, I'm in trouble here. You're good here. I hate when that happens. <laughs> oh, there we go. So, um, we'll talk a little bit about the rotator cuff and how does it work. Thank you. Appreciate it. Got a model here, but we'll go over very briefly. I'll just uh, kind of give you the, uh, be able to pass this around um, if you'd like. Um, so, this happens to be a model of a right shoulder. So when we talk about shoulders, the conversation oftentimes um, centers around the rotator cuff. So I'm gonna explain what the rotator cuff is, our current understanding of it. Um, typically, if you hear about someone's rotator cuff, it's usually in a conversation where the conversation isn't good. Like you hear sports injuries, you know, pictures, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, or people like, hey, you got a rotator cuff tear. We'll talk a little bit about that, but I think it's important just to understand what it basically is uh, and, and how it relates to shoulder function. So this is actually a right shoulder. This is a bony model of the collarbone. It comes over and meets this angled bone, triangular bone called your scapula. And um, that meets about where the brow line would be, the bra strap would be. There's a ball and socket here where your arm meets your sleeve. This is... Um, about proportionality of a golf ball on a, on, a, on a, excuse me, on a softball on a golf tee. There's a little bony uh, part in there, and you can peek in there. That's that's the, the if you will, the bony connection of the uh, upper arm to the shoulder blade. These red things here are the rotator cuff muscles. In the back, there's three of them. There's uh, there's there's it's called the spine of the scapula. This is called your supraspinatus. It's above the spine of your scapula. This is your infraspinatus. And there's a small muscle here just underneath that pen mark. And that's your teres minor. That's the smallest of the rotator cuff muscles. So all these muscles come from the shoulder blade, cross the ball and socket joint, and the capsule of the shoulder, the joint capsule, 
is a blend of those tendons. Tendons are what muscles use to connect into bones um, and connective tissue to form a protective layer of that shoulder joint. Those back rotator cuff muscles are balanced by the front rotator cuff muscle, which in this instance is the subscapularis, it's below the scapula. So they form this sling. Rotator cuff muscles are like um, the stage hands <coughs> or the sound and the equipment when you go see a performance like at the Grand or somewhere, right? Like it's the behind the scenes things, right? Like nobody goes up and flexes their supraspinatus muscle in a bodybuilding shell, for instance, right? These are the deep muscles that are supposed to be active to keep a good tension between this upper arm and the rest of your body as you move twist and bend. Human body is magnificent in that uh, this rotator cuff muscle is responsible for maintaining good tension and positioning of that ball and socket joint as a person can reach essentially in, a, in a, almost a 360 degree sphere, essentially in a 360 degree sphere. So there's lots of mobility in the system which makes it vulnerable. Um, so that's a little bit about the rotator cuffs. We're going to talk about tears and the implication of that, how relevant that is, and how to rehab them uh, or recover from them. There's also your biceps tendon that's here, and yes, biceps do relate to the shoulder in some capacity. Um, so which piece is the rotator cuff? I mean, you find the muscles that the, you... The rotator cuff is, is essentially collective? this area here where my fingers are, so okay. you that white part here okay. as, as we pass that around. So by all means, you know, Disconnect that, turn that around. Um, so that's the rotator cuff. And that's typically, if that joint is challenged, that's where it might be challenged. Here's just some illustrations of that. Um, so so um, I entered the profession in the early 90s. And what happened in the early 90s is, was the advent of widespread use of the MRI. And the MRIs were able to see lots of fine detail into the body. We love MRIs, they're great. What happened was, is you could see very fine detail into all parts. And depending upon the focus of, a, of that particular clinician and the current thinking, that's gonna bias towards decisions as to how to manage uh, musculoskeletal and bone conditions, right? So we use MRIs to, to identify significant internal problems. We also use it in musculoskeletal medicine and MRIs can um, help determine whether or not that rotator cuff area has what they're called tears in it. There's two types of tears that they identify, either full thickness tears through the, all of that tissue or partial thickness tears. In the early 90s, it was believed if you had a full thickness tear, regardless of the cause, that you were required <coughs> to have surgery for a good outcome. It was believed if you had a partial tear in that area that you'd likely have to have surgery for a good outcome. Um, that was nearly 30 years ago, and the evidence and clinical support does not necessarily support that, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about why, right? Um, so typically when, the, when there's a problem in and around the shoulder area, the pain is oftentimes where the shirt meets the sleeve or somewhere towards the front of the upper arm or back of the upper arm. Sometimes there's, there's irritation that extends up into the neck area of the upper back. So we're going to talk a little bit about the different contributing factors to shoulder pain. Uh, they're, they're more than just the rotator cuff. So um, none of you, so there's, there's mistakes that people can make with rotator cuff problems. One is do nothing. This is not this group. You're showing up here and you're paying attention um, to and, and getting options for what you do. If you let shoulder you know, shoulder pain and stiffness hang around for a while, it can get a bit more difficult to treat. Not that you can't treat it, but sometimes stiffness develops. Hey, it hurts, I don't move it as much. Stiffness develops and then increased problems develop because of that with increased nerve sensitivity, weakness, and the like. We'll talk a little bit about each of those. Um, <clears throat> in my opinion, spending time on approaches that aren't getting you to a higher level of functional recovery and a bit active life is uh, not helpful. So if, if we're doing any sort of treatment, if it's not getting you back to sleeping through the night, full reaching comfort on a consistent basis, then it might be time to find a different path. Um, 
Another mistake that people can make with shoulder and rotator cuff problems is to mask it with over-the-counter um, NSAIDs, braces, pain gels, creams, lotions, and especially muscle relaxants and opioids. I think we're all aware that opioids, for instance, are neither safe nor effective for long-term pain. Um, non Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, even over-the-counter ones, pose some significant um, increased risks of challenges to kidneys, uh, liver, cardiovascular system, and the, the gut tract. So um, for individuals who are looking at options other than that, there are other options. Uh, this is the big one. I, I'm, I'm big into considering holistic options that involve um, all aspects of shoulder pain in preference for a single solution. We're going to talk about different contributing factors, what there's different potential contributing factors. There might be different things that can be uh, used to help manage pain and increase strength for the goal of getting back to your active life. Some people active life is just, hey, I wanna make it uh, through the night sleeping. I wanna be able to manage things in my, in my home. Other folks might wanna get after it with workouts to the Y, pickleball, um, work, handling stuff overhead in the yard or at home, whatever that may be, right? That's, that's the goal is to get comfortable, to do the things that we wanna be able to do and to do it without fear and concern of getting weaker over time. <clears throat> Um, so another mistake folks can make is relying exclusively on surgery or injections. Um, I was delighted. I had an individual in here um, recently who is an exception to this rule. She went to a, an orthopedist and um, not in the area, in actually California. And uh, she was pleading for an injection to get some pain relief. And then afterwards he said, I'll only give you this if you intend to do some sort of rehabilitation afterwards knowing full well the evidence doesn't support an injection is going to take care of it in isolation for a very long period of time. Injections can quickly damper pain, can quickly damper inflammation, and can maybe increase ease of movement and strength for a bit. Um, there's two issues with that. Number one, the one that's most obvious is, well, something likely contributed to that shoulder pain to begin with. So if you have an injection and you don't do anything to change your flexibility or strength, chances are your body's gonna come back to that original state because nothing else has really changed. The second thing is there's increasing evidence that uh, injections not only weaken connective tissue, that is the very rotator cuff and the muscles and, and the ligaments in the area, but they also accelerate and increase the rate of not only cartilage loss in joints, but also bone loss underneath joints. There's some evolving research that, that I'm uh, uh, picking up and that's been evident for the last couple of years showing that that's the case with cortisone injections and that's one of the reasons why they oftentimes advise maybe one or two injections um, but anybody who's had injections <coughs> here, has any of those risks been talked about with you probably not that's unfortunate right so um, those are some mistakes that we can make with shoulder um, uh, ro rotator cuff uh, issues. Uh, certainly, uh, we've talked about a number of different things that we want to get back to uh, being able to do comfortably, whether it's desk work, reaching overhead, dressing, sleep postures, and especially exercise. If you can trigger pain in, in, in certain movements, chances are you can reduce the pain and address it. <clears throat> Three ways to handle shoulder pain would be to ignore it, um, to try to alter it, meaning essentially mask it with over-the-counter pain medications, lotions, braces, avoidance, that sort of thing, or properly handle it. We'll talk about further some, some different contributing factors of shoulder problems and uh, talk about potential ways to handle it properly. Questions so far? <clears throat> All right, I'll keep going. So please interrupt me with questions. Mm -hmm. So these are a uh, series of. <laughs> these are some uh, common causes of shoulder and rotator cuff problems. So the first one is stiffness in the rotator cuff. Um, this might be evidence for, for people who can't quite reach into their back pocket, feel stiff. Um, 
Furthermore, um, some folks report, hey, it seems like it's frozen. It just, it feels stuck. Even if I try to help raise it. More comfort when the arm is at your side. Um, and the rotator cuff, the joint, there's a, the rotator cuff makes a joint capsule, if you will. And that's a connective tissue that holds in the joint lubrication fluid. So in other words, I'm uh, gonna complete this uh, discussion. Um, so this, this forms a joint here. So this joint forms a capsule and there is connective tissue that when you raise your arm or reach forward, there needs to be a <coughs> folding of some of the tissues in that joint capsule. And um, when there's tightness in that shoulder joint capsule, tightness most likely is caused by inflammation when you strain your shoulder <clears throat> or um, when you jar your shoulder, have some trauma, there might be some remaining inflammation that sticks around there. So as you're protecting that, that inflammation, uh, it, your shoulder joint is bathed in that and that may cause cross hatching. So when you raise your arm up, ordinarily there's tissues underneath this shoulder joint capsule that should fold open like an accordion and those can oftentimes instead of folding open they are oftentimes adhered down to this cross adhering in the connective tissue if you will some sort of scarring natural scarring so that's stiffness in that uh, shoulder joint um, that is very common and it's typically not assessed in medical offices and, and uh, really never assessed in orthopedist office e orthopedist offices either. <clears throat> There's another issue called uh, tendon <clears throat> weakness, sometimes called tendinopathy. <clears throat> and that's when uh, the tissues can become uh, actually thinner um, and not only due to um, inflammation, but just due to the tissues just get what we call disorganized. The, the nice, uh, uh, sturdy tissue becomes too thin. This is evidence for folks with pain with lifting when they're trying to raise their arm. It's evidence when handling items, even up to chest level, and the shoulder generally feels weak. Can I have a question? Yes. Um, does the MRI show those weakenings, or how is that diagnosed? Is it just by history, or...? So, um, when someone's reading an MRI, they can see different things. So if they're keen on that as a potential problem, they will. It's routinely not. Okay. Generally, when, when the MRI is reviewed for shoulder issues, they're looking for the bony positions, they're looking for any abnormalities in the connective tissue of the uh, joint itself. Um, sometimes they look at some of the thickness. Um, it can be. Um, but the bias is towards finding abnormalities in the labrum uh, for younger folks and in tears in the rotator cuff muscle as opposed to how thick the connective tissue is. So does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Irritated shoulder area nerves. So there's a number of nerves in, that sh in and around that shoulder area in the presence of inflammation, in the presence of weakness. and those nerves become irritated. They become hyperactive. That can become a problem in and of itself. The nerves become jacked up. So this would be evidence for a shoulder that has increased pain with very little use. Doesn't take a lot to bring this stuff on and the pain lasts a lot longer than you'd expect for the type of activity that you're doing. This is common for individuals who think, who, who kind of say, hey, you know what, I have to lay low for a few days. <coughs> and then, um, or after activity, or I have to prepare for some activity by laying low, and then I do some activity and it's bothersome for two or three days at a time. In that instance, those nerves might be just over, over uh, active, if you will, or hyperactive. So the pain can oftentimes last for even up to 48 hours after use. Oftentimes there's a there's at the same time perhaps a neck problem or an upper back problem. Um, noisy neighbors talk to each other, right? So in one area the nervous system is irritated and jacked up, another area near that or in that vicinity can also get jacked up too. And that's irritated shoulder area nerves. 
those sort of things generally are not shown up on x-ray, MRI, or CT scans. Um, they're only really detected with proper uh, what we call clinical history and, and, and physical examination. Um, so if the questions aren't asked about the type of pain, how it develops, we're not going to have an understanding of this sort of problem being with an individual. <clears throat> There's an issue called true weakness of the rotator cuff uh, in the shoulder area, and that can be associated with just generalized weakness. Um, so one of the things that, can ha that happens after age 25 is we experience a, a decline in, in strength in our muscle, muscle bones uh, if we're not challenging them properly. So that's age 25, about 1 to 3% of muscle loss every year. If someone takes that out a couple of decades, two, three, four decades, um, a little bit each year starts to take its toll. So if, if there's kind of generalized weakness in that area, and you're attempting to use your shoulder with muscles that have become somewhat weakened over time because you haven't kept up their conditioning, that's a mismatch, right? <clears throat> it's kind of like trying to pull a boat with a four-cylinder vehicle, right? It's, it's the, the, the muscles are underpowered to do that activity. And that's kind of generalized weakness. Um, that can come about as a, with a sudden loss of strength, and it could be associated with a rotator cuff tear. Um, some of the weakness patterns, if it's not associated with a tear, won't show up on x-ray, MRI, or CT scan, or at least it won't be identified or looked for, and proper examination history tends to rule that out, particularly challenging testing the muscles in and around the shoulder and seeing where is, where is the strength relative to what that person needs to do the sort of things they need to do, right? It's a lot different being able to manage things in and around the house as opposed to in the yard, as opposed to doing a significant amount of repetitive work overhead with 15 plus pounds overhead. So um, we're gonna talk a little bit about MRI and x-ray and secrets that aren't often told. And um, this research um, has been around for a while. And um, this chart is an example of one particular study from uh, just before 2000s. This is out of the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery. It's a top tier medical <coughs> orthopedic journal. And what this shows is the, the um, presence of tears in the rotator cuff that are present with successive decades of life. So this is in the 50s, this is in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So in this study, and this is one of the studies that show the least amount of these, these are asymptomatic folks, meaning they don't happen to have any problems. So how did they get these folks to have an MRI? They had an MRI for their shoulder region for things other than shoulder pain, and they were identified as not having particular shoulder problems. So they assembled them, and they had, in this study, they had radiologists read those and said, hey, look, Look at those studies and, and see if you can determine if there's uh, full thickness tears in these rotator cuffs. So in the 50s, 13% of folks who don't have any symptoms have evidence of rotator cuff tears. That increases over time to at least 50% of folks in, in their 80s, half folks who don't have any pain, have rotator cuff tears on MRI, which is pretty interesting. They're not having any pain, but they show uh, abnormalities. This study has been repeated um, many times all over the world with very similar results. In fact, the percentage is typically in most research is higher than the percentage looked at here and even are in presence in ages younger than age 50. <clears throat> um, in the early 90s, it was presumed, like I said, that people needed to have rotator cuff repair surgeries for what are called full thickness tears of the rotator cuff. Um, and over time, there's some evidence that that may not be the case, right? So this is a particular study. Um, this one, I remember actually, this, this study came out in 2013. I remember very clearly reading this study. Um, what this study looked at was uh, atraumatic, that is shoulder rotator cuff tears that didn't have a cause that could fall on, on an outstretched arm or direct trauma to the shoulder. Uh, they have evidence of full thickness tears. At that time, the standard of care was shoulder rotator cuff surgery. 
what they did is they, they, they entered people into this study. Those were five clinical sites across the United States. And they followed these individuals for two years. And what they did was they um, divided them up between those that went to surgery for rotator cuff tears and those that didn't go to surgery. The brilliance of this was that an individual who didn't have surgery could choose to have surgery at any time during the course of the study uh, because that was assumed that people just need that for bad shoulder pain with rotator cuff tears. So people didn't feel like they were missing out on things. So instead of having surgery, they, they uh, underwent a treatment protocol, a treatment protocol that mirrors the type of treatment that we do here, uh, which involves um, a, a structured exercise component in addition to an individualized, what's called manual therapy approach to um, all sorts of joints that include the ball and socket joint, the acromioclavicular joint here, the shoulder blade, the upper neck, uh, or excuse me, the neck area and the upper back area. So the clinicians were to find and identify any restrictions in those areas, whether it be ribs, whether it be the upper spine, neck, or other joints of that shoulder, treat that with some hands-on work in addition to prescribing an exercise uh, sequence that individuals would do. And what they found that um, both groups had, ex had equivalent outcomes at two years. In fact, uh, the, the um, editorial board at this journal said the only difference between the outcomes, or the, rather the number one predictor of whether or not someone would achieve benefit from a surgical versus non-surgical outcome in the study was their preference. So someone thought, hey, I'd like to have surgery. They did, they did okay with surgery. And by the way, what tends to happen after rotator cuff surgery? What type of treatments do people get? Therapy. <laughs> Right? They get some rest, they get progressive range of motion, they get progressive strengthening. Right? So um, there wouldn't be many orthopedic, sur orthopedic surgeons who would do a rotator cuff surgery without follow-up strength and conditioning for that area. Right? Mm -hmm. So um, this fundamentally changed the way that I viewed how to help folks with rotator cuff tears, partial and full fitness tears. Um, my conversations changed with patients, my treatment approach changed with patients, and what I was hoping for was that my, my colleagues, my physical therapy uh, 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 people, and eventually the medical community and orthopedists would change the way they have discussions with patients. Regrettably, that didn't happen as uh, I would expect. And that study essentially was done 10 years ago, right? Now this information is becoming a little bit more commonplace in university hospitals, these sort of discussions are potentially had. Um, in this region, not always. Even my physical therapy colleagues uh, don't always um, enthusiastically advocate for non-surgical care. I can't explain why. The evidence is there. The other thing to know about this, this research has been replicated again, time and time again since that time, all over the world with very similar outcomes. The average treatment uh, sessions for the therapy was 11, 11 and a half treatments, if you will, over a 12 week period. So just to let you know what the treatments kind of consisted of. Questions about that? <clears throat> this is repeated again in 2014. This one looked at uh, actual cost, uh, basically exercise and, exercise and hands-on work uh, were uh, similar outcomes, 75% uh, recovery in both groups, equal recovery between uh, the rehabilitation approach versus the surgery approach with um, obviously less cost, right? It's tough to run up physical therapy bills equivalent to what a surgical bill would be. Some folks have arthritis in their shoulder joint, right? And arthritis is generally pretty common in age groups 50 plus, right? Mm -hmm. So pain and weakness aren't always as a result of the arthritis. Um, so conservative treatment or non-surgical treatment can be really helpful in increasing flexibility of that joint, 
strengthening of those muscles in and around that shoulder and helping that individual progress towards increased training. Um, one of the things that's common right now is that people are fairly familiar with individuals who have had rotator cuff tear, tear repairs, right? Surgical repairs. Those people we know because they have usually an arm sling, they have to avoid driving, they're out of, out of life for a good number of months, three, six, nine months, and sometimes they don't really recover well. Um, that is not a, uh, you know, some folks are like, you know what, if I have to have that, maybe, but I'd rather not, right? They're looking for other options. Um, shoulder arthritis was originally one of those things that was proposed to have maybe total reverse shoulder surgeries for, which are, are becoming more widespreadly uh, used. And in fact, in one of these presentations, the uh, first line of treatment, the last time I presented on this topic in, in this clinic, I had three individuals who went to an orthopedist. Their first line of treatment was a total reverse shoulder replacement for typical shoulder pain and stiffness. So, frozen shoulder is kind of a specialty kind of issue. And anybody here ever have a frozen shoulder or understand, know anybody who did? What is it? Exactly? Frozen shoulder. What is it? So frozen shoulder is when someone gets nearly a, almost a sudden stiffness in the range of motion loss. So it's when that connective tissue is really adhered down in that shoulder joint. Um, it's fairly common, much more common in women than men. So they think maybe there's some hormonal contribution. It's a little bit more common in individuals who have, um, have diabetes, but people, you know, men who don't have diabetes sometimes get this as well, right? It's, it's, that shoulder is really stiff, forward reaching is stiff, sideways reaching is more stiff, upward reaching is almost impossible, and people can barely pick their own back pocket, right? That's a hallmark feature of frozen shoulder. Um, that's another contributing factor to it. How does it happen? <clears throat> Oftentimes we don't know. Sometimes it can happen after a, a, a sprain or strain of the shoulder or some sort of injury, and the person starts to not use it so much. Um, that's another kind of case. It's called adhesive capsulitis. And unless someone look for it, looks for it on x-ray, it will not show up on x-ray, CT scan, or MRI. Um, so. What's the difference between a um, CT scan and an MRI? So an, an MRI um, has greater ability to see all types of tissues. A CT scan is, is and it's um, people who have any metal type of implants can't go through a MRI scan. The CT is, is basically a high-powered x-ray. Um, the x-ray doesn't show muscle, does it? X-ray might show a little bit of presence of, of, of swelling around muscles, but an x-ray doesn't show much, right? We <clears throat> typically, the, the, you know, let's x-ray that, see what's going on. If we don't see a whole lot there, maybe we'll get an MRI, that sort of thing, right? That's it's kind of, for some folks, it's a fishing expedition for some clinicians. It's like, well, we just get an x-ray. Right? And that might be appropriate in some instances, right? Wouldn't that where you start because it's cheaper? <sighs> you know, see if there's a bone fragment or whatever. Ideally, yeah. Sometimes it's just like, well, we got shoulder pain. Let's see if we can find out why, right? The best use of those tests are to have the clinician be thinking about it. Like, what are we trying to predict or rule out, right? Like, for instance, if, if you've got some creaking in that shoulder joint as you move through it, and that shoulder joint is enlarged a little bit, a little bit thicker, and you're age over 50 or 60, um, do you really need an x-ray to determine that you've got arthritis there? Probably not, right? Thickness of the joint, some creak creaking in that joint, stiffness, you likely have some arthritis there. Do, does that person want to do anything about it or is it going to change the, the clinical decision making is the question, right? So the x-ray can see arthritis? Yes. See forms of arthritis, yeah. Arthritis is change in the bony structure. So, yeah. so frozen shoulder, one misnomer about this is there's, like if you Google frozen shoulder, if anybody's got that, you'll see even on medical sites, they'll say, well, it kind of gets better on its own within six to six to 24 months, like it just spontaneously reduces. And for some individuals, that may be true. It's a very small percentage. 
most folks, they can't raise up their arm much, and they just stop trying, and they figure out a way to kind of adapt. It does not resolve on its own. It doesn't, I'm not sure if anybody here is describing frozen shoulder issues here, but it's one of the, one of the common contributing factors for shoulder problems. Question. Is it possible to have more than one issue? More than me. <laughs> is the bicep included too? I, I didn't hear anything that was making the shoulder. Yeah, so certainly you can get the, the, the bicep tendon can become irritated, and there's a very close association. Don't, I don't include it in the presentation, uh, but certainly you can get an irritation of the biceps. That could be a primary cause of the problem. Uh, maybe you get a little bit of calcium in there. Um, it can also be that your bicep is irritated because that shoulder is just too stiff and doesn't move right. There's only so much room that that ball and socket joint has, and if there's not enough room in the joint, that biceps tendon here can um, be irritated because there's just too much compression on it, right? So ordinarily those joint surfaces have a little bit of separation to them <clears throat> and clearance as you move your arm up and down. But in the, if that's stiff in that shoulder joint and you're going to move, you can get almost like a bony bump into that biceps tendon to cause irritation. But you can get a number of issues there. There's some, some, some tests that can be done to determine the contributing factors of that. Those folks, they tend to have very pressure point pain here, and physical examination can oftentimes start to identify uh, whether or not there's other areas involved or not. So I think that was the one issue that I didn't cover on here that people generally brought up. So. <laughs> Can, can uh, is it possible to have more than one issue? Almost always, right? So, um, <clears throat> some different contributing causes to shoulder pain. This is kind of like theoretical, like, hey, this is what most individuals who tend to show up for these type of presentations, these are most the things that tend to bring this on. Questions about any of that? <clears throat> All right. Great. So the next part is we do what we call, this is the favorite part of the show, I think, is the five minute mirror <coughs> part where you get a chance to, just to see how uh, we might do an abbreviated assessment <coughs> treatment for an individual so that you can get an idea of how, how things are assessed. And then we uh, oftentimes are cheering for a positive response in terms of pain relief or increased flexibility. And then, and then we can uh, um, get some ideas about what that looks like for that individual there. So, with that, um, <clears throat> who uh, would like to um, subject themselves to this, if you will? <laughs> um, so, three gentlemen in the front. Um, <coughs> so, um, you've got, you've, uh, uh, what's your name again, please? Jerry. Jerry, if you don't mind, if Jerry will take a look at yours. You have some stiffness in that shoulder joint, too, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So perfect, this will give me a chance to uh, show some additional things that I haven't seen in, in one of these Five Minute Miracles before, so this is great. So, All right, so what we're gonna do, uh, if that's okay, uh, is we're gonna have Jerry come up here and we'll, um, actually we'll probably rearrange the uh, camera. We might switch around. Is it warm in here or is it just me? A little bit, I might try to crack a window in here because I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt. We've got uh, 14 people in here, so. Um, <laughs> So let's do this, if you don't mind. I, I might use that treatment table in the back for this. So I, what, what I, yeah, I think we will. So we're just gonna, gonna kind of switch through here. And um, tell me about uh, when your shoulder trouble started and oh, how it developed. In my younger years, I would, I loved doing push-ups. Okay. So, I would do hot dog push-ups. You know, I might stand right here and hit the floor, and then it would hurt the shoulder. I'd put two chairs out, and I'd do this. One-handed push-ups, which not a good thing. You're, you're a beast, but it took a toll on your shoulder. Yeah. Okay. What type of work did you do? Uh, I was a factory worker, a machine operator. Okay. And then you've been having problems with your shoulder for a good number of years. Yes. Okay. On and off to heal up and, and get better. 
Mm -hmm. Any treatments that you used in the past or interventions you used in the past? Nothing. Not much? Just non-use. Got it, right? Okay. Describe where you're, what, you, what you feel and where you feel it right now. Well, I, I still have pretty good motion. Back here is not good. And then I, I have a problem with the bicep. And uh, I'll wake up and it just aches. Or try to get to sleep too and it just aches. Got it. <clears throat> and if you feel like when you're holding things, carrying things, like a load, that that bothers you? Yeah, it's usually, you know, down here. You know, when I'm carrying something. You got it. Okay. Fair enough. All right. So what we'll do is we'll do an assessment of your mobility, see where you're at. Might shoot some measurements here, but we'll see where you're at. So first thing I'm going to have you do, if you would, is let's take a look. At, let me just uh, kind of feel what is bothersome right there. Mm -hmm. Does that bring on your symptoms? Does that feel very similar to what oh, you feel? Yeah. Okay. What if we do that? I feel that. That's okay. Okay. And that, that, and that is what you feel when it bothers you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. You can stay there. I'll have you take your left hand, and lead with your thumb, reach straight up and over your head. We're going to see what kind of flexibility you have on this side. <clears throat> Just going to measure that. All right, thank you. 163. And do the same thing on the other side, only at the point that's reasonably comfortable. In other words, don't put yourself out. Your mobility is about 14 degrees off, right? To the mm -hmm. left. Yeah, and you're right handed. We'd expect your right arm to be more mobile than his left. I'm, I'm yeah. ambidextrous. Are you ambidextrous? Okay. <laughs> up, up, arm up to the side. Thank you. And the other side. Not moving very smoothly there, is he? I mean, he's probably about 10, 15 degrees off on that side too, but you sort of get to reach up behind your back as far as you can with your left, with your right, yeah. It's far enough. Far. <laughs> Bother some for this one too? Well, it's tight a little bit, and the other side as well. Yeah, that's definitely far enough. Okay, let's check the uh, rotator cuff muscle integrity, right? So. First one is you were able to slowly lower your arms at your side. It's called the drop arm test, but we'll test it further. Bring your elbows in. Keep your elbows in, bring your hands out. We're gonna check out your external rotators. Hold, don't let me move you, don't let me move you, don't let me move you. Good, don't let me move you. A bit of weakness there. We, don't ex we wouldn't expect him to have profound weakness there. Um, we don't have a strong suspicion of rotator cuff tears. We're gonna check it out. I have you take your left hand in your tummy. Bring your elbow forward. Hold your hand there. Don't let me move you. Don't let me move you. Thank you. Now switch. Right hand in your tummy. This elbow forward. Maintain yourself there. Don't let me move you. Don't let me move you. Bothersome there? Mm -hmm. A little bit. Okay. Bring your hands a little bit forward. Hold them there. Don't let me move you. Don't let me move you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Fair amount of weakness there. Okay. Elbow up. Hand back. Hold yourself there, don't let me move you. Let's check in the smallest of the rotator cuff muscle, the teres minor muscle, now push forward. We're checking for signs of instability in the shoulder joint. Any bother with that? Not too bad. Okay, raise your other arm up, hand back. Don't let me move you, don't let me move you. Decent strength there, push your hand forward. Any bother there? Yeah, I can feel it coming forward. Feel it coming forward, okay. <laughs> All right, if you don't mind, um, maybe perhaps kick off your shoes and then lie on your back. <clears throat> Check out some other motions lying down on your back. I'm going to block his shoulder blade, and we're going to see how much his ball and socket joint move in a number of ways. Relax, allow me to move you. I'm not going to do anything tricky, sudden, or forceful. If I block his shoulder blade, this elbow should come up to about his ear, bottom of his earlobe. 
it gets up to just a little bit beyond the right angle or beyond the shoulder. This side is the shoulder as well, actually. I want to see what we can do with Cam back. <clears throat> Ideally, this should go easily back in line with the table. A bit stiff there, <clears throat> but not bad. We're going to check turning in. Fingertips should come close to the table. <clears throat> He's got a bit of stiffness in that one as well. He said this one bothers you as well? Sometimes. 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 Okay. This is the one that, you know, it's, it's leaking right now. Got it. Does that ease it up the aching a little bit? Yeah. yeah. Irritated. What's that? Irritated. Is it less irritated with your hand here? Oh, no. no, no. Just, just in general from okay. what we've been doing. Got it. <laughs> So again, his elbow should come up to about his ear, if you will, if I block his shoulder blade there. You see what kind of motion he has here. Okay, bring this up. <clears throat> so on that shoulder model, if you don't mind grabbing it right there, huh? Second motion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have you ever used anything on that? Creams, lotions, nope. anything like that? Okay. Hey Robin. Mm -hmm. Now would you mind running one of those containers along it or all? So I let so what I'm so he's got Oftentimes people self-diagnose themselves. Sometimes people are right. Um, he does have what I would call bicephalic tendonitis. Right? So, good job. Did you Google that or just know it's, that's where it's at? I just know it's bothering me. <laughs> so I'm gonna do a couple things here. First thing I'm gonna do is see if we can't create a little bit easier uh, motion for that biceps to be in. If you don't mind, stay on your back to slide towards me a little bit. Good, thank you. And I'm going to do something we call joint mobilization, which is loosening up that shoulder joint capsule to allow for a little bit easier flexibility and movement there. <clears throat> so he's supported here. I'm not going to do anything sudden, tricky, or forceful. I'm just going to give a little bit of gentle movement into that ball and socket joint to create a little bit of increased flexibility there. This should be comfortable. Right now, with your arm in this position, any discomfort? Mm -hmm. Good. I'm going to give you a little bit of traction there. And then I'm going to give you just a little bit of pressure there to get a little gentle stretch through that shoulder joint capsule. You might feel a little bit of shift in that shoulder joint. <clears throat> you sense that a little bit? It feels good. Feels good, right? So taking some pressure off of that joint, if you will. So his biceps tendon comes up on the upper arm joint. I'm actually taking the upper portion of his upper arm and I'm pulling it down towards his ankle a little bit, selectively in that joint. This is called joint mobilization. So these joint structures have pain receptors and movement receptors inside of them. So for Jerry, most of the time when he feels a shoulder, it's painful. This gives him different sensations other than pain and allows for increased flexibility in that joint so we can start to interrupt that pain response. So he's got stiffness in the shoulder joint capsule. He's got irritation in that tendon. And he's most likely got some sensitivity in those nerves. I'm going to train that. <laughs> if you had to, you could probably wrap off some push-ups. I could do it, but then I would pay for it. You, yeah, you pay for it, right? So. Now he likely has some imbalance in muscle strength. So as a young man, he did lots of um, work to develop his show muscles, right? His triceps and his chest, right? Um, and maybe he didn't do so much work to strengthen his upper back. And over time that may have created a, an imbalance between the back and front muscles. Does that sound accurate? Sure. 
Most people that do weight training, especially men, they don't do a really balanced approach, right? And this, I'm a guy, I'm, I was guilty of that too, right? Um, we're doing a little bit of motion now, going up and down this way to loosen that joint up. <clears throat> Comfortable? Mm -hmm. So you did get to Riviera Maya though, right? I did. Like no one just bought you the t-shirt and made you stay home? <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's nice of her. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna block that shoulder blade again. I don't know what kind of change we're gonna induce here. I mean, this, he's had this for a long time, but we're gonna check it out. I'm blocking that shoulder blade again and saying, how much will this raise up? Any bother with that? Mm -hmm. Anybody notice a difference with that? Yeah, 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 that you feel a difference with that? I do. Yeah. So here's the thing, is we know that this tendon is irritated. I believe treatment has to be directed here too. If we only direct treatment at the place where the yaoi is, then this other stuff that's helping to contribute to that is not going to get better. Does that make sense? Or it's, it's not going to change much, so it's going to be hard to keep that. So we're going to expand this treatment, right? So this is one aspect of it. I'm thinking we might, or I could retest that sensitivity. How does that area now? I still feel still feel irritating. Yeah. yeah. So he needs some assistance there. But let's check, let's check him. Have a seat, please. <clears throat> one thing, just have a seat for a moment. I'm alone on the table here. One of the things we like to do, um, so I don't, I mean if someone has MRIs and x-rays or I think we need them, I'm happy to uh, help <clears throat> obtain those, right? <clears throat> My confirmation of whether or not I'm right is to assess, <coughs> is to assess his movements. Jerry, I'm going to have you. Oh, my. We're not done with you yet. I thought I was sitting there. No, sorry. <laughs> just, just sit right here. Um, I have confirmation of does this affect that person's pain or movement in real time? If it does, then I know, check. That's something that we want to add to his plan of care, right? If it's not, either I didn't do it right, do enough of it, or there's something else that needs to be done, and we don't do that, right? So we start to start to add things that are helpful and stack uh, uh, helpful things. So if you don't mind coming up to standing. So we're looking for what we call a within session change. This is the definition of this five minute miracle, right? So if you would please, uh, I'm gonna have you take that right arm and reach it up over your head again in front. Notice what that seems like for you. And come back down. What do you notice about it? The quality of movement. The quality of movement was different. You don't need to be a trained clinician to see that. Right. We're humans. Yeah. We can see when quality of movement has changed. What did that feel like for you compared to the first? Felt better than the first time. Nice. Yeah. Good. And then up to the side. Up to the side may also be changed. We don't know. Check it out. Nice. Good. Super. Check. We need to include that in his plan of care. Certainly, he's gonna need some direct treatment to that biceps tendon that's been irritated a while. He may very well have some stiffness in his upper back that's feeding to that in neck. Um, uh, so we want to make sure that we treat everything in this area and whatever's contributing to this so he has the best chance of lasting success. So, nice job. So, I feel like... Oh, you felt that? Oh, sorry. No, no, not that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the abuse. The abuse, yeah, yeah. So, you know, for someone like Jerry, I mean, obviously, this is all, obviously all that he would need. We need to uh, move through a, a, um, probably other things as well. In particular, find out, okay, what do you want to be able to do? Do you want to get back to push-ups? Okay, if you do, then we need to kind of create a plan so that when he does them, they just irritate them and slowly build that tissue back up. But chances are we're going to need to do... Um, significant amount of work for the other muscles to take off some of that work as well. So create more space for that ball and socket joint to move, ir lessen the irritation there. So some treatments might include some deep tissue massage. I was going to use my fancy deep tissue massage, the side blade of a massage tool. The better uses a massage tool, we have those as well. He'd likely benefit from that. He may really benefit from some dry needling, which is the use of acupuncture needles. He doesn't like needles, needles, that's fine. We don't have to use that, but that's one thing that might be really helpful. That can help 
uh, dry needling. People familiar with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to use some acupuncture needles without mm -hmm. injection to help decrease nerve sensitivity and to promote healing. People get better without it, but that might be a really good option. He may actually benefit from something that I don't really use a whole lot, and that's ultrasound. If it's a small area of irritation, that might be beneficial. So we can start to talk about the sort of things and stack that. We didn't do a, quite a full examination, but that was pretty close. Like I might talk to him a little bit more and talk to him about his pain patterns and such. Um, another question is how long might that last? I think if he doesn't do anything in terms of a new flexibility exercise or a new way to reach, it may last a few hours to a few days. He's gonna have to do more. His body wants to pull back into old patterns, right? So in, in a treatment plan of care, what we look at is uh, a reasonable expectation and understanding of, hey, you're gonna need so many sessions over so many weeks. Early on, we're interested in relieving pain. We're interested in improving flexibility, uh, calming that nerve down, and then over time, we, over time, the next step is we wanna increase strength in the supporting muscles that need to be increased. We wanna restore appropriate posture um, uh, relative to what he needs, and then eventually get to a point where he's developed, uh, he's got a developed program in which he does pain relieving exercises, flexibility exercises on a more regular basis, a few of those, and then maybe a few times a week he's doing higher level strength and conditioning in line with what he wants to do. If he wants to get back to, I don't know what his life is, I don't know if he likes to fish or hunt or you know, golf, but or, or work out, whatever that is, we want to make sure that we have a program that allows him to do that and build up to that as opposed to just adapt to it and avoid it, right? We want to get him not only feeling good, but back to his active life. Yes. So say he wanted to get back to doing push-ups. That's one of my things. I can't do push-ups anymore. Uh -huh. So during the course of therapy, is the, is the push-ups out or don't do them until we do work your magic? Or um, is that realistic that he can get back to push-ups like he wants? Um, so I think that like the two things in the shoulder that, that, that can, that, that are, that come along later in recovery are, being able to raise your arm up to the side with resistance, like with weights, and doing deeper push-ups, right? Um, if it bothers, probably don't do it. Can you get back to it? Absolutely. But will that cause the problems all over again? And if we man if we properly manage all the other stuff, no. Right? So it's it, you know, there's like some folks would say don't do push-ups ever as after a certain age. I think that's silly. Yeah. Like, but don't do push-ups if it's irritated. And if it is irritated, let's find a solution to get back to him, right? So there's different ways that he can start to train. Maybe the, maybe when he starts training, does the top one-fourth of the movement. And maybe without those elbows splayed out, maybe with him in a little bit. Or if that's a lot, maybe he goes back to kneeling push-ups. Or maybe he uses lights, light weights to start with, right? So. I, I, I'm, I'm a gym guy, you know. I like, if someone wants to be active in the gym, great. If they don't want to be, that's okay too, right? So it wouldn't matter if it's swimming. Like if he was a swimmer, like and he wants to get back to swimming and that's his thing, well, let's figure out how we get back there. Let's not just accommodate to it, right? <clears throat> I'm probably not going to encourage him to, to become a competitive overhead power lifter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but if he wanted to, and we set up reasonable expectations, I think we could train for that. I mean, you know, he's not ancient. He can get back. <coughs> Even if you're older, we, we see folks in their 70s, 80s, 90s. We don't have an upper age where people can't get stronger with things. People are more adaptable when they're younger. We got to admit that. But we, we're smarter as we get older. So we can use that uh, to our advantage, right? So. Well, we lose muscle mass as we age. And muscle mass can be replaced, right? You can, you can, you can start to, to, to improve that as, as you know. Here. So. so that's kind of what a treatment plan looks like. So that's, on the wall, we have four phases of plan of care. You know, first, first is relieve pain and inflammation. That's in the red. Second is correct the root cause of the problems, which is, which is oftentimes joint and posture imbalances. Third phase is build strength uh, so that people can get back to the sort of strength that they need to get back to their uh, life, work, and hobbies. And then the last stage is preserve, build up some robust nature so, so at the end of it, you're a robust human being that can do the sort of things that life will demand of you, right? So people, whether they like it or not, they're already weightlifting. 
right? They're lifting up the laundry baskets. They're trying to put stuff into upper cabinets. Um, they're oftentimes doing overhead stuff in yard work. Um, so you're already doing it, right? It's just a matter of, are you doing it in such a way that is you're causing irritation? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and some people don't want to lift weights, that's fine. That's not the focus of it, it's whatever you want to be able to do. After someone's done with the plan of care, they don't have to do anything. You know, most of the folks that I see on the street who are doing really well, I ask them, hey, how's it going? Oh, pretty good, you still following that program? Yeah, pretty closely, right? <clears throat> that helps, that helps a stack to uh, being able to not have that problem again, so. Cool, I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue onward, so if there's other questions about Jerry specifically, Good session, by the way. So, I had one, one, I think one episode where it didn't work out in five years. So, this guy had a, probably a massive rotator cuff tear. Um, but, um, so um, that's a little bit about what we do. Um, and um, so the next, the, the next step is that we're certainly uh, happy to invite you in you've got a number of things resources some of you look through them already um, some of which is the testimonials some folks that we've helped in the past um, the other uh, is folks that show up we're happy to extend a complimentary we call discovery visit and that's where you can come on in and get a look just like we did with Jerry here to see what's going on in your circumstance perhaps do a trial treatment see what kind of options are available for you we're happy to let you know what that looks like for you in terms of afterwards what that looks like for potential number of sessions uh, and your costs. We can run an insurance verification, let you know what your costs would be at the end of that session, so that you know what your that scope of work looks like. Um, we have uh, availability on timesheets around the room based on the days. Those are those yellow slips there. Um, trying to figure out how they're organized. Um, right here. Wednesday. All the way around the room. So like if you're looking at that, that's the 18th, 24th, 25th, and back to there, right? So um, you're certainly welcome to grab one of those time slots, come on in, work with one of our clinicians, and, and uh, get that appraised. See what, see what that looks like for you. Yes? Uh, what do you think of like the TENS unit? Do you know what I'm talking about? What do you think of that? I think TENS can be useful to help calm down some pain. Um, some of the research is mixed. Some folks like to use it, other folks don't. If it you know, it's, has a low harm, low risks, if you will. Um, the one thing that I will say is if someone's just looking to TENS or just looking to hot pack for some symptom relief, they're probably gonna always require that. Someone's gotta change for that pain to kind of, if you will, be managed properly so they don't have to rely on it as much. So we do use it on occasion. We actually use the TENS, if you will, or a similar type of device, TENS, with needles when we do needle to help get deeper healing response and recovery. So it can be useful, right? It's a whole lot better than opioids and uh, muscle relaxants and even over-the-counter non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, in my opinion. Much less, much higher safety profile. Um, so, uh, Dan, tell me about your shoulder. What's, what's going on now? And, uh, tell well, right now, on. it's right here in the front. And it's just, it's a deep pocket burning is what it always feels like. Like I keep push on it, that's where I can tell that spot exactly. Got it. And how long has it been going on? Decade. Yeah. Any sort of specific injury that brought that on? Falling out of a tree, throw, threw my chainsaw. Because I was up the tree cutting limbs off. And a limb came back, hit me, knocked me out of the tree, and I the saw in my hand. I threw the saw and I got caught in the tree on my way down because my safety harness, but I didn't want to have the saw in my hand when I was swinging it. So, for sure. So, for it sure. was that quick throwing while I was flying backwards that I mean, that's when it started. Yeah. And then uh, over the years, uh, it was a car accident. We had a little sports car, um, rear engine, and uh, it was just that sudden jer jolt with whiplash and all that. We had treatment from that. And then just recently, just actually last weekend, uh, wiped out skiing, hit an ice chunk coming down double black, and so I got my face all dinged up. Um, and that it landed hard on that shoulder. So that's pretty much what re-irritated it again. Got it, okay. So, 
So, um, you know, some, when, I'm, when I'm assessing shoulders, I start to kind of think about the likelihood of what might be going on. So in Dan's mm -hmm. instance, he's got multiple episodes of trauma. Yeah, so it wouldn't happen, yeah. Would be, would be trauma. But, you know, he gets back in the game. So um, and he's probably got a pretty good healing capacity based on that. What do you, right. what do you do for a living? I sell skis and service ski equipment. Okay, great. So test Really? Driving. Where? Two years old. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't think I've ever met you there. No, I'm Good. only about three, four days a week, but okay, nice. I work with Greg Bach. I don't know if you know him. Uh, Back in the corner. Yep. Yeah. The older old guy. Okay. It's just him and I are the only two of those guys there. Call him the wizard. <laughs> nice. All right, sounds good. So what I'm going to do is, um, um, first of all, I'll, I'll probably just do we'll do an assessment of your mobility. Okay. Take a look at your rotator cuff integrity from a physical examination point of view. Um, and then we'll test, I'll do some special tests, see what might be contributing to that. But you're, you're telling me you have symptoms. It's right in this pocket, right where, right where, right where the muscle meets. Let's see what you're on down. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Okay. Not that. No, it's down. Not there. More in there. Right in there in the pocket more. Fair enough. All right. So I'm just going to observe your movements. If you would, on your left side, you lead with your thumb, reach up and over your head. Any bother there? No. While you're here, I'm going to do a test. Just to allow yourself to relax. Okay, thank you. Reach up your other side, please. He's struggling to get up there, right? So he's got some stiffness in there. Yeah, right. stiff all down. through this whole thing. Okay. And that's not new. That's been with you for a while. Oh, yeah, it's always been nice stiff. Okay, fair enough. Just re irritated though. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. You bother some at the top there? Up here? Yeah. yeah it just feels tight. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just relax and let me move you. What about this? Yeah, it feels tight. Okay. Doesn't bring on your symptoms though. No, I don't bring on the symptoms. Okay. I'm off to the side of the snow angel, please. On this side, if you would, please. Uh, just On this side. side. Yep. Reach up towards the ceiling with your thumb. Way up, way up, way up. Keep going up, keep going up. And back down. And thank you. On the other side. Yeah. You bother some right there. Okay? Right, right about in there. Yep, that's where it pinches. And then once you raise your arm up further, it goes away. Goes away. Okay, so it's called, a, it's called a painful arc. So yeah. I'm collecting some data here, right? Collecting some information. All right now, I'm going to have you bring your elbows in. Keep your elbows in and bring your hands out. We're going to test your external rotators and your shoulder muscles. Hold, don't let me move you. Hold. Good strength there. Good strength there. Put your left hand in your tummy. Give it this hand, please. Put your, this oh, hand in your tummy. The other left. Bring your elbow forward. That's it. Hold your hand to your belly. Don't let me move you. Good. So we're checking the subscapularis muscle. Mm -hmm. Looks pretty decent there. We're going to check a couple other muscles here. Hand back. Smallest of the rotator cuff muscles we're testing here. Hold. Don't let me move you. I felt that. <clears throat> felt that in that shoulder? Yeah, yeah I felt that in that shoulder. Hand back. Hold. Don't let me move you. Any bother with that? It's not, it's not loving that, right? I'm not loving it. Pushing in forward. How about that? Yeah, I feel that too. Okay. Right through the front. Yeah, so that's yeah. a sign of maybe some what we call instability, right? So we're starting to get a picture of he's got some stiffness in that area. Could be protective stiffness because he's irritated. Could have some joint capsule stiffness. We're going to investigate that in a little bit. But he definitely has motor control problems. So his muscles don't know how to keep up right now for whatever reason, right? Uh, I'm going to check another muscle area. I'm going to just put your hand here. Don't let me move you. Good. And now the other side. Hold. Don't let me move you. Just forget, I can't forget, about it, right? forget about it. Forget yeah. about it. Is that painful or just weak? That, no, that, 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 yeah, that hurts. That hurts. Okay. There, yeah. So painful and weak. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we'll take a look at this a little further. Take off your shoes, please. If you don't mind lying back, we're going to take a look at a couple things further. So, sunny side up. Like 
catch up. So where, where was the uh, Skeo incident at? Oh, they ran a few of off the creek. Okay. Next thing is, I'm just going to check the movement of the ball and socket joint. On its, on its, relax on it. Yeah, just relax. I'm just going to control how much his shoulder blade moves. Ideally, his elbow will move up to his earlobe, bottom of his earlobe, and no problem with that. That hand should go back, so it's could rest on the floor if you were lying on his back. Not much problem there. A little bit here, no bother there. You guys need to get going. Uh, silly, you guys. Okay. <clears throat> so I'll be controlled, cool. Difference right to the left there? A little bit. That's some stiffness. Yeah, you're feeling the difference. Pretty stiff right now. Yeah. Hand back. Doesn't quite get there, right? Mm -hmm. And here, right? So he's got a mixed presentation, right? He's got significant weakness in one of the rotator cuff muscles. That or when we test it, that could be as a result of the pain and stiffness in the shoulder joint. It could be Irritation with the, in the shoulder, or, or, or could possibly be a significant tear. I don't think so because he got he he gets back in the game, right? Um, who knows, right? So rotator cuff irritation, stiffness, and then this muscle control problem. If you have stiffness, the muscles don't know how to work. So the first thing I'm going to do is just a little bit of mobilization of that shoulder joint. See if we can't get it, uh, some sort of release in the muscle here. Am I okay to do a little bit of uh, work mm -hmm. through that? Uh, so what I'm going to do is just a gentle kind of joint mobilization technique. So that your elbow rests as best you can. That's it. You're going to feel a shift into that shoulder joint. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Have a great night. Right. A little bothersome there? I can feel it, yeah. Yeah, so he's not loving that, right? So, <clears throat> so he's not reacting positive to that. We're not going to do more of that right now, right? Might try to find another approach or... I might try another strategy and see how we do with more of a muscle control strategy, which I think is the direction I want to go. Have a seat, please. So I don't have the advantage of like detailed imagery with this. If someone, if I feel someone needs some imagery, I'll certainly, I'll certainly get it. And there are some folks who do it. You can keep your, you can keep your shoes off. I'm just going to step right here. Right, okay. Yep. Um, On this table? Oh, we're just going to stand here, right? right. Um, but we have this test retest. Like I can, I can do an assessment, do an intervention. How does it perform after that? If it's a bit better, if there's a change in the pain or flexibility, then we know, hey, we can maybe do a little bit more on that. He wasn't loving that joint mobilization technique, maybe because he's got more of an instability issue. So we're going to kind of check that out. Muscle, help the muscles coordinate better. So you're going to just keep your elbow resting right here. Is that comfortable for you? Right there. Yeah. Okay. Just maintain yourself there. Don't let me move you. Don't let me move you. Good. Any bother with that? No. Good. I'm going to do a little bit more on that. Just giving them light resistance, maybe 5, 10 pounds, nothing too crazy. Maintain yeah. yourself there. Don't let me move you. Don't let me move you. Activating his triceps. Trying to activate a little bit of his lat. Kind of get a, have a hand behind his arm. Don't allow him to move you forward. Good. So the muscles don't squeeze your elbow in at your side. Don't let me, there we go. Yeah. Good. A little bit the internal rotators. Hold. And just activate some of these muscles here. Now we're going to do multiple directions. So all you need to do is just maintain yourself here. Mm -hmm. Just match my resistance. Okay. So when I back off, you back off. You have to kind of wait until you feel where I'm at. So what I'm challenging his nervous system, his central nervous system, to respond to a variable patterning of muscle activation patterns. So that he can get better muscle control over this. Good. I like to feel it twinge when you're pushing. Or you're a little bit, right? Yep. So very light resistance here, right? Don't so take I think much. I'm thinking he's got a muscular control issue. It's one of his primary issues, right? Hmm. Doing any better with this level of muscle yeah. activation? Yeah. So we don't yeah. spend so much time there. We yeah. better. So there's a number of strategies we can do with this, right? We might spend a few more moments in this, and then we'll retest.
part now. I'm not sure how this is going to turn out, but let's see how the upward reaching is now. Is it all the way around? Oh, yeah. Yep. Back down. Yeah, I mean, I, you still feel it's there. It's not as bad. I mean, it's not as burning. So you can feel the, uh, when I get to about here, you can still feel it, but it's, it's not as, yep. it's like a hot needle. So and that's then, what I feel like. And then up to the side, all the way up, all the way up. Yeah, I still I don't feel anything on that way. That nice. feels pretty good. So. so here's the thing. Structurally, we didn't change anything in the shoulder, right? So there's if there's something scary in there, like some sort of bone spur or mm -hmm. labral tear, a whole number of things that you that can that can be wrong in there. That's not going to change for, from a muscle activation pattern. So we resort the deck a little bit. His number one issue is most likely a motor control issue. He needs better muscle control so that when he raises his arm, that those rotator cuff muscles know how to respond to, to sure. that. And um, hmm. yeah, he may have some issues. You know, potentially we could see if he's got any issues in upper thoracic spine that are contributing to that, or maybe into his neck. But I think for the most part, he's got a motor control issue. Hmm. There's a whole wide variety of exercise strategies for that. Right. Usually, really good outcomes. So good to know. Super, Dan. All thank right. you so much. Appreciate yeah. uh, you. appreciate you. Uh, Volunteering your yeah. shoulder to science. <laughs> All right, so in his instance, a plan of care might include some hands-on work. He may benefit from some um, muscle massage work to kind of stimulate tissues. Um, there's this, there's this uh, neurological connection between what one can feel in the body area and how they control their movement. So maybe we do a bit of massage or different tissue work in there to stimulate those tissues to help his brain get a better idea how that area works. Um, um, might be a number of coordination type strengthening ahead of that robust strength and conditioning, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have to get that fine muscle control before you get those big muscles a bit stronger. He's got good muscle mass. I mean, we test his muscles out, not bad, um, but it's gonna take a bit, I think, for those, you know, a number of sessions for those yeah, muscles right. to catch up, right?